Thank you very much, Professor Gerotziafas. I'm going to share now my presentation. I think it's here. OK. You can see it, right? OK. So uh, yes, uh, I work in a venous thrombomolysis unit in the internal medicine section department in the hospital Gregorio Marañón in Madrid. Uh, now it's a temporarily a COVID unit because basically we are uh, uh, managing still managing patients with COVID. I'm still in charge of COVID patients. So um, this is the um, uh, how the presentation is going to to be. Uh, how I have organized my presentation. So first of all, I want to give you some hints, some details, uh, brief details about how the COVID-19 crisis was in Spain. Uh, in Spain, we had a, a, we are one of the, unfortunately, one of the uh, countries in the world with more cases. Uh, we had to, uh, here you have a picture of uh, medicalized hotels. Uh, this is the field hospital here in Madrid. And this is one of the many, many ICU we had to open for COVID patients. So we had the first uh, isolated cases by the end of January. Uh, and we have to say that uh, because we didn't take it uh, seriously enough, uh, I'm talking about scientific uh, 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 scientists and also politicians, uh, full preventive measures uh, were not taken. And by the first week of March, you know, everything went very, very fast. And cases multiplied mainly in the cities where we had more more. Uh, more, more inhabitants. It's, this is Madrid and, and Barcelona main, mainly. And uh, by the 14th of, of March, it was declared the, the Spain lockdown, the situation of uh, the state of, of alarm. And then uh, everyone was uh, said to remain home and uh, all that you know uh, from the news. Uh, by uh, the 7th of June, we had 242,000 confirmed patients, uh, cases with PCR, and around 17, uh, 27. Uh, a thousand um, deaths. Uh, by estimation, we know that the, the uh, number of uh, cases in the population, it's around five, six percent of the population. So it's around two million Sp Spanish, uh, Spanish people are, have been infected by the virus. Um, that's the estimation. And in my hospital, which is one of the biggest hospitals in the country, we, has, uh, we, had, we uh, treated uh, around 5,000 cases. Uh, 260, uh, 2,600 2, required hospital admission and more than 150 patients required ICU admission. And we had to increase by five the number, the capacity of our ICU. We opened beds in the ICU beds in the operating rooms. And also we had to adapt the university library of our hospital to admit patients in the ICU because there's actually there was no space for these patients. Uh, as of today, we have the situation is much better, but we still have around 80, 90 patients admitted, 15 of them still in the ICU uh, setting. So how do we organize the hospital? Well, basically, what we do, what we did, I mean, internal medicine had a priority role uh, because, among other things, we have we have a, a department with more with more uh, physicians. So what we did is we had a, 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 each ward had around 40 patients. So we, what we did, we had 22 wards led by an internal medicine professional and two wards led by pneumology and one ward led by infectious diseases. And uh, since we, we were not uh, enough uh, people to rule this department, what we did is we did multidisciplinary teams uh, led by internal medicine in, in, in most cases, but with uh, residents and specialists from geriatricians, endocrinologists, hematologists, pediatricians, surgeons, um, and the intensive care units, units were basically uh, uh, led by intensivists, anesthesiologists, and also cardiologists. Out of the hospital, we had the primary care for non-severe cases. We had medicalized hotels uh, for isolation of cases, patients who could not go home to, uh, because they could not be isolated at home. Uh, we we opened a field hospital in Madrid with a, more than a thousand uh, beds for patients who required mostly observation, but not very severe cases. And we also medicalized nursing homes to avoid patients go from nursing homes to have to be admitted to the hospital. So, going in deeper, how how do how do we organize this medical ward in a situation of of pandemic of crisis? So uh, first of all, it's important to uh, restrain the uh, access to uh, the units and the rooms. So basically, we have uh, closed doors in all of the hospital. Uh, 
also the room of patients are sealed, so there is no uh, risk of contamination. And we, uh, there was an important restriction of people entering the room, only one doctor or nurse or assistant per patient uh, each time. Um, all rooms where there was devices with high flow oxygen or aerosolization, which is not common, aerosolization is not commonly needed in these patients. But if that was the case, it has to be clearly specified and avoid entrance uh, unless it's strictly necessary. And in that case, you need to wear FFP3 masks to avoid the uh, contagion. And uh, this is important because we learned, we learned this the hard way. Uh, crash cart must be equipped with all the material for the situation of emergency, which is gonna happen because it's very common to have patients with uh, uh, cardiac arrest uh, when there is a uh, pandemic with co co uh, coronavirus. So everything has to be opened and ready to use so you can run, you can uh, safely wear yourself, uh, equip yourself and enter the room with everything you're gonna need to treat these patients because otherwise it's gonna be really, really uh, um, a situation of, of mess. Um, General recommendations, things that seem simple but are actually very, very helpful. It's, for example, measuring oxygen saturation of patients every time someone enters the room. No matter if it's the nurse, the assistant, or the doctor, every time someone uh, enters the room, we need to assess the oxygen saturation of the patients because even though they look well, oxygen saturation can really drop before the patient even can tell it. Uh, at the end of the day, we have to clearly indicate those patients with DNR order on the nursing control board. So we clearly distinguish uh, those who in case of an emergency need to be resuscitated. And this is very important in the daily medical records. We only, we, uh, it's very important to record the days from the beginning of symptoms, the days from the COVID diagnosis and the days from the start of each drug. This is because we know, we now know that patients around the seventh and ninth day of, of beginning of the symptoms is when patients uh, enter the inflammatory phase and they, they, they get worse, they, the clinical uh, situation gets worse, and we have to be aware of that uh, and really uh, watch out for these patients because those are the ones who might need ICU admission. Communication with, rel with relatives, it was prohibited to uh, enter the, to visit its, visits to the hospital were prohibited during the pandemic, and we basically ha had uh, updates uh, through the phone. We provided patients with tablet, uh, tablets or smartphones to communicate with their families, and this really helped a lot. Uh, and we only allowed visits in really restrained cases of patients uh, in a situation uh, of, of um, close to uh, death or situations where the patient really need to be with their family. But this, as, I, as I said, this was very restricted. This is the essential material in the medical world. I'm not going to stop here because this is uh, probably very basic. Uh, but this recommendation uh, I can do uh, for uh, each room, we recommend to have one pulse oximeter for every patient, one stethoscope, one sigma manometer, and of course, alcohol or disinfectant gel on the door inside another room uh, in each room and for each uh, patient. This is going to help a lot when, you, when we do the, the rounds in the morning. Um, so once we will have a patient in the hospital, uh, a, a question that uh, they ask me uh, very often is, uh, when do I have to test the patients? How often do I have to repeat blood tests or repeat x-ray? And of course, this is not uh, standardized, but uh, I can give recommendations according to what we have seen in clinical practice. Uh, so this is, um, fortunately, uh, patients with uh, COVID-19, they don't require very like fancy uh, blood tests uh, when, we, uh, when they are admitted. In most cases, they are uh, common tests in clinical practice. So uh, we obtain in the first assessment of these patients in the emergency, we obtain a cell blood count, coagulation. Uh, blood gases are mostly, not, in most cases, not required because we know what we're going to see. We're going to see low oxygen. So in most cases, oxygen saturation with a pulse oximeter is enough, but uh, severe patients are going to require, to require uh, blood gases, arterial blood gases, and biochemistry. So I, I summarize here the common findings in these patients and findings that are not that common. For example, in the blood count, lymphopenia and thrombocytopenia are common, especially thrombocytopenia, especially in severe patients, as it has been commented before. And the coagulation is very common to find elevated fibrinogen, uh, mildly, uh, in, in mild cases or moderate cases, uh, elevated INR or prothrombin time. And D-dimer, it's uh, uh, commonly elevated 
the diamond we know it's related with a poor prognosis, but it, it is not always the rule. We also say see, see patients who are doing well and actually do well with strikingly high levels of the dimer. We've seen levels of the dimer we have never seen even in patients with thrombosis and cancer. I'm talking about numbers of 70,000, 80,000 uh, the dimer. This is something we have never seen before. And as I said, we work in a BTE clinic and we see the dimers all every day. Uh, in biochemistry, the most common findings are elevate, elevated C-reactive proteins, uh, mildly elevated transaminases, and uh, elevated levels of uh, creatine kinase and uh, LDH. Uh, procalcitonin, on the other way, is typically not elevated because that's a finding that has to rise the suspicion of bacterial infection more than COVID-19 infection. Kidney injury is not common in severe or, sorry, in mild or moderate forms of the disease, but in the ICU setting is actually pretty common, but in the medical world is not the, the, the most common finding. So in the medical world, uh, we, when we want to reassess the, the patient, uh, the, the blood test, we order the same tests, but we added the levels of ferritin and interleukin-6. I say in the medical world because these tests are usually not available in the emergency, not in our hospital. So we uh, assess ferritin and interleukin-6 patients to have an uh, assessment of the inflammatory situation of the patient, and also HIV tests, especially in those patients who are treated with lopinavir, ritonavir, because uh, we need to know if, the, if, there is, if they are positive and there, if there might be a resistance to the, to the drug. But uh, as I said, this, these tests are common in clinical practice. So the question is, how often do we have to test patients? Um, for blood tests, we always recommend it to perform the first, uh, um, of, 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 after the first assessment in the emergency room, we recommended one uh, at least 24, uh, at 48 hours after the first assessment. And especially if the uh, inflammatory markers are elevated or the uh, progression of the patient is, is uh, bad, we recommend repeating every 40, 24, 48 hours to assess this inflammatory state. That is going to help us decide some treatments, some anti-inflammatory treatments that we will comment uh, in a few slides. Um, and this is very important about the chest X-ray. How often do we have to repeat a chest X-ray? Uh, in the common pneumonias, in bacterial pneumonias, we are used to uh, follow uh, clinical guidance. I mean, if the patient is doing well, we don't need to repeat a chest X-ray in, mo in, in most cases, and if the patient is doing bad, we repeat the chest X-ray. This is probably not helpful in COVID-19 patients because of this. The progression of the pulmonary infiltrates can and does precede clinical deterioration. So my advice is you repeat chest X-ray, even if the patient is doing at least stable or even a little bit better, repeat the chest X-ray because sometimes there's a, a, a X-ray deterioration before the clinical deterioration. And similar, similarly happens with the oxygen saturation. We see patients that really tolerate very well the lack of oxygen. You can see a patient with a good uh, respiratory situation, but the oxygen saturation drops to 85%. I mean, it's, it's surprising how this happened in patients with COVID-19. And the electrocardiogram, our cardiologists insisted that we repeated them every two or three days, especially if the patients uh, were taking drugs that prolong a QT inter interval for the risk of, uh, of uh, malignant arrhythmias. This is just an example of a chest X-ray, uh, the typical evolution of a chest X-ray. This is a patient that was actually going, doing uh, better. We see how the infiltrates, the peripheral infiltrates, tend to form consolidates uh, and, uh, in the following days. And these uh, findings can last for weeks after, after discharge even. So uh, for medical and, and, and oxygen supply, for medical uh, management of COVID-19 patients, if someone was hoping to uh, get like a clear statement, a clear algorithm or what should be done. I am sorry, but this is not the case because as you uh, very well know, there is very, very little evidence-based recommendations for uh, medical therapy in COVID-19 patients. So what we did is basically what we could. We give patients treatments, most of them based in in vitro observations or in observational, weak observational studies. So this, uh, what I'm gonna show you is the recommendations we gave in our hospital, updated to the last uh, changes uh, that have been performed in the last week. But again, it is very important, as I, as I say here, uh, the evidence is 
very weak for some drugs, and there is no evidence for most drugs uh, coming from cl controlled clinical trials. And the priority should always be referring patients to clinical tri trials instead of using an unappro unapproved drugs. This is the, uh, the um, optimal, but this is not the reality. The reality is that uh, we use uh, drugs in most patients out of the clinical trials. Uh, and that's why it's very important to uh, inform the patients of uh, the drugs we're going to use and, and that there is no uh, efficacy proven. Uh, the primum non nocere uh, uh, principle should uh, always remain. First, do no harm. Evaluate, really assess the risk in each patient before giving the drug. And as I said, giving an informed consent. So basically, this slide that has appeared uh, in many uh, uh, present appears uh, in many presentations um, basically resumes what we know of the evolution of the disease. We know that there is a first stage where there is an increase uh, uh, in a viral response and uh, multiplication of the virus, and then we enter in this uh, second stage, the pulmonary phase, that is characterized that it is characterized by an inflammatory response. That if it continues, uh, puts the patients in a third phase characterized mainly by a hyper-inflammatory hyper, hyper response. Not all patients are going to enter in the stage two or three, but uh, those who do are the ones who are going to need probably a more aggressive treatment. So the patient, uh, the uh, treatments in the phase two and three are basically targeted uh, to uh, decrease this inflammatory response. That's where we, we, we've, we've used corticosteroids, inhibitors of interleukin-6, inhibitors of interleukin-2, JAK inhibitors, all these drugs have been used in this inflammatory response phase. So these were the algorithms algorithms we use in our hospital. Um, uh, for patients with uh, clinical features and a PCR positive, but with no findings of pneumonia, uh, what we did is if, this, uh, if the symptoms were uh, mild or the patient had no comorbidities, we um, um, recommended symptomatic treatment and monitoring and no, uh, giving no drug to the patient. And for those patients older than 60 with comorbidities, we recommended considering the use of hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, um, plus uh, lopinavir with ritonavir or hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. Uh, again, now we know from the very recent findings of uh, different observational studies that probably hydroxychloroquine is not recommended and we are actually taking it out of this uh, algorithm, but this has been the recommendations uh, until a few days in our hospital. This is what we, we did in patients uh, in the outpatient setting. No treatment for mild cases with no pneumonia and considering uh, treatment with hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir ritonavir in patients with comorbidities or um, older than six, 60 years old. What did we recommend for patients with pneumonia? For patients with pneumonia, in those younger than 65, 65 years with no comorbidities and no criteria of severity, and for this we use the, any of the uh, um, tools for assessment of uh, uh, risk of severity, like the CURVE 65 score, we recommended lopinavir ritonavir with uh, plus hydroxychloroquine. This in patients with no criteria of severity and no comorbidities. For patients with comorbidities and criteria of severity or criteria of severity, we used uh, the combination of lopinavir, ritonavir, or azithromycin, not together in combination because of the risk of QT prolongation, plus hydroxychloroquine. And in the beginning, we also used inter interferon, but we had to stop using it because uh, the, um, we, we had no availability of the drug. But probably the drugs where we find, uh, at least in the hospital setting, we, we, we find more uh, better results maybe are the ones we used in the inflammatory phase in patients with respiratory distress. And these are remdesivir, which has been available only, only a few weeks, uh, bef I mean, uh, in the last few weeks. So in the beginning, we didn't use it. Now we are using remdesivir uh, or tocilizumab, which is the one we used in the beginning of the pandemic, and uh, corticosteroid pulses in those patients with an inflammatory um, response. Again, no evidence for what we did in all of these uh, cases. When, we di when, when did we consider tocilizumab? Uh, when the patient had interstitial pneumonia with severe respiratory failure, uh, 
and there was a rapid respiratory worsening with progressive uh, increase in the demand of, uh, of oxygen supply. And the patient had criteria of uh, inflammation, systemic inflammatory response, like in elevated levels of interleukin-6, elevated D-dimer, or progressive elevation of D-dimer levels. Uh, of course, we have to bear in mind all of the contraindications of tocilizumab. And the other drug we use uh, very commonly in the beginning of the pandemic was pulse of asteroids. Uh, again, in very similar conditions that those where we use tocilizumab. What we did is patients with respiratory distress and inf markers of inflammation like D-dimer, ferritin, um, C-reactive protein. In those patients, we recommended pulses of asteroids. And in our hospital, we use methylprednisolone 250 milligrams for three days or dexamethasone 40 milligrams intravenous for four days. This is the recommendation we did for the use of corticosteroids in our patients. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, different drugs that we used uh, in the treatment of COVID-19 and the dosing and the, uh, um, the duration of the treatment. This is basically uh, based on the information in the uh, drug sheet. So it's uh, um, available. We didn't did uh, anything outside of the recommendation for other diseases. Um, and for, uh, for the oxygen supply in, in, in patients, this is where I think uh, the, um, there is more evidence. We, we, were, we based in uh, considerations from other forms of uh, respiratory distress. Uh, first of all, in a situation of hypoxemic respiratory failure, we use oxygen therapy with nasal cannula with, uh, to maintain oxygen saturation uh, higher than 93%. Uh, if the clinical course was bad in that case, then we recommended uh, upgrading to oxygen therapy with non-rebreather mask, mask with a minimum of 10 to 15 liters per minute, or at this stage, even considering ICU. But the reality in the situation of a pandemic that this was not possible. A patient who was scaled from oxygen, from a nasal cannula to non-rebreather was not considered for ICU because basically we had no beds for ICU for these patients. We reserved ICU for patients who required endotracheal intubation. So from oxygen nasal cannula, we moved to non-rebreather mask. And with the, if with the non-rebreather, the patient still has having a poor clinical course, then the patient was considered for ICU admission. But still at this point, many patients could not be admitted in the ICU because imagine the situation we had at some point, uh, 1,200 patients admitted in the medical ward and only 110 beds of ICU, all of them were BC. So if the patient has ICU criteria, but there were no ICU beds available or the patient was no candidate for ICU, the next step was using high flow oxygen therapy through nasal cannula. If this was not available because at some point all of them were in use by other patients, we had uh, dozens of high flow oxygen therapy, but still at some point they were all in use. So we considered CPAP systems with oxygen, the like Businac type, um, and we had to invent systems temporarily until we had the opportunity to do endotracheal intubation for these patients. We use systems like this, pneumologists in our hospital uh, using uh, decathlon masks uh, uh, connected to two uh, connections of oxygen. They created this system like a temporary measure before doing endotracheal intubation. Again, in this case, this is not a recommendation. This is not something we are actually proud of. This is what we did in times of war. This is what we have. So before the patient was considered uh, for endotracheal intubation or for those patients who were not uh, candidates for ICU, we had to invent these kinds of systems. Um, and uh, finally, for BTE prophylaxis, I am... Uh, very uh, happy with the presentation of, of Professor uh, Gerard Chiafas. We basically uh, uh, summarized all the information we had so far. Um, we have to say that, uh, as, as uh, it has been well stated, that some of the observational studies have suggested that there's a higher incidence of BTE in, in COVID-19, especially in the ICU setting. But this is very important to remark. The risk of bleeding in this patient has not been evaluated. There is 20,000 papers in, COVID, in PubMed so far, none of them to evaluate the risk of bleeding in COVID-19. We are conducting a study, the, the members of the Rieta Registry, where, that I belong to, 
along with Emmanuel Monreal from, from Barcelona, we are uh, running a study called the Riete Bleeding Study for COVID-19 patients. It's still not uh, published. We are analyzing the, uh, starting to analyze data this week. But the preliminary information we have is COVID-19 patients bleed, especially in the ICU setting. They bleed probably more than non-COVID-19 patients. So this is something that we need to uh, bear in mind when we recommend uh, higher than prophylaxis doses uh, for patients with COVID-19. We don't know. I mean, we know that probably patients with a higher risk of thrombosis are those with a higher risk of bleeding. And my personal opinion, because this was a, a very uh, uh, common uh, cause for discussion in Spain and in my hospital, d diamond levels should not guide the dosing of prophylaxis. We should use clinical parameters, but not d dimer because d dimer basically, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know how to state it, but d dimer levels go crazy in patients with COVID-19. We know it's associated with a poor prognosis, but in some patients with mild form of the disease, d dimer goes absolutely crazy. We lose it as a tool for BT diagnosis because it's elevated in many patients, and, and we don't know exactly what that uh, means uh, um, when we are talking about risk of venous thromboembolism. Of course, for all pa patients with a previous indication for anticoagulation, we recommended a, a switching, uh, admit, at least during hospital admission, to low molecular weight, weight heparin, especially to avoid interaction with other drugs. And we performed a study in our center, evaluated the incidence, the incidence of asymptomatic deep vein thrombosis in patients with COVID-19 uh, in the medical ward, and we find that the levels of asymptomatic DBT are high, but not higher than those seen in other acute medical patients. So um, this is a finding in, in 160 patients in our study. So this is the, um, the um, uh, prophylactic BTE dose we recommended. It's basically uh, the standard uh, doses for all patients un unless contraindicated. Uh, Bemiparin 3,500 uh, three, units a day or 4,000 units in the case of enoxaparin. And as an alternative, we had fondaparin for patients with a um, contraindication to low molecular weight heparin. In case of renal failure, adjusted dose according to, to the drug sheet. And uh, this is uh, the only um, situation where in my hospital, we recommended different doses. In patients with obesity, with a VMI higher than 35, or patients in the ICU setting, or patients with a previous VTE event who were not uh, uh, anticoagulated at, at that moment, we recommended a little bit higher uh, dose of uh, low molecular weight heparin, 60 milligrams daily or 6,000 units in the case of phenoxaparin, or 5,000 uh, units in the case of uh, vemiparin, which are the heparins we use in my hospital. And at hospital discharge, we recommended for patients with immobilization, immobilization at home or other risk factors for BTE, we recommended extending prophylaxis for 7 to 14 uh, days. Um, and uh, to, to, uh, uh, to finish, yeah, uh, just the one slide. Uh, what we do at discharge for patients with negative PCR, they were sent home, basically. And patients with positive PCR, we have three options. Sending them to a nursing home till they were negative. Sending them to a medicalized hospital so they were observed until, until they could be sent home or sending them home if there was a, a possibility of doing isolation at their uh, home and uh, safely from their relatives. Uh, so these are the conclusions. And uh, my uh, only uh, hope, my only recommendation for those countries who have not suffered this uh, crazy wave, this crazy crisis of, of coronavirus, is that I hope this, this information is not useful for you. It's only uh, to learn and to uh, know a little bit more, but I hope you never need to use this information because it's really, really been uh, a few crazy months and I don't recommend this to anyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.